Hello, everyone. I'm Jeff Rozell. I'm the Vice President of Programs here at the Knowles Teacher Initiative. My co-presenter today is Rebecca Bradshaw, who is our Accounting and Marketing Assistant. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we're going to today provide an overview of the Knowles Teacher Initiative and our Teaching Fellows Program. Uh, during the presentation today, like Rebecca mentioned, we encourage you to use the Q&A box on your screen to ask any questions you might have. Rebecca will relay those questions to me throughout the presentation. She'll be sorting through them uh, to make sure that we get all of your questions answered. And if she has time, she'll also answer some of them as typed response responses and you'll be able to see those as the presentation goes on. The Knowles Teacher Initiative, formerly the Knowles Science Teaching Foundation, was established by Janet C. and uh, Janet H. and C. Harry Knowles in 1999 to increase the number of high quality high school science and mathematics teachers and ultimately improve math and science education in the U.S. At Knowles, we believe that teachers can and should be the primary agents of educational improvement, and this belief is woven throughout all aspects of the foundation's programming, uh, including our teaching fellows program, which we'll discuss in detail today. <clears throat> so today I'll provide a, a brief overview of the Knowles teaching fellows program and the program benefits. I'll also review our eligibility requirements and the application process. So uh, we'll begin with uh, an overview of the program. Being a new teacher uh, in today's world is extremely challenging. New teachers must face the diverse needs of all their students. They must navigate the challenging political terrain of school systems in order to have an impact. Uh, and they do this with enormous pressure because no one in education plays a more important role in students' opportunities and outcomes than the teacher. The Knowles Teacher Initiative understands that teaching is a critically important, complex, and intellectually challenging endeavor and has designed its programs to support new teachers in this challenging world. The Knowles Teaching Fellows Program is a five-year program that supports early career high school mathematics and science teachers um, in their efforts to develop teaching expertise and to lead from the classroom. Each year, we award approximately 35 fellowships to new math and science teachers with great disciplinary knowledge, who possess leadership potential, and are committed to becoming great teachers. In phase one, the first three years of the program, fellows reflect on and deepen their own mathematics or science knowledge, especially in the context of the curriculum they teach. They come to understand how to increase access to learning for all of their students and use that understanding to create new learning opportunities for their students. And they engage in practitioner inquiry with one another, learning increasingly sophisticated ways to collect, share, and analyze data that help them see new things in their classroom. Those are supported in becoming a community of inquiry that engages with and as critical friends. And this emphasis on inquiry with others serves as the foundation for teachers leading from the classroom. In phase two, the last two years of the program, the focus of inquiry shifts from a fellow's classroom to the professional community in which the fellow works and coming to understand the whole system at play in their school community. As they learn to understand their school and local community as a system, they come to understand multiple leverage points for change and experiment with ways to lead those communities toward more equitable outcomes. The knowledge they gain from this inquiry is useful to others and fellows get practice in making that knowledge public to others. Fellows are supported in bringing their school colleagues into their work by making themselves vulnerable and open to others' perspectives. So I've just described a quick summary of the curriculum of our program. But an equally important thread that holds together our teaching fellowship is the use of cohorts to build connections and community. 
we build our fellows program on a cohort model that allows fellows to connect with their peers who are at roughly the same point in their teaching careers. And these groups that fellows form in their cohorts allow them to experience small learning communities and experiment with various roles teachers might play in those communities. Those small learning groups strengthen the connections between our fellows, but they also model small peer-led teacher communities in ways that help our teachers reimagine the working relationships in their own schools. Our fellows also have multiple opportunities to work with colleagues beyond their own cohort uh, in things we call special interest groups or regional groups or in groups focused on teaching specific disciplinary skills or groups teaching in similar contexts. Before switching gears to discuss the benefits of the Knowles Teaching Fellows uh, Fellowship, I do want to briefly highlight our Senior Fellows Program. After completing the fifth year of the fellowship, teaching fellows become senior fellows, and through the Senior Fellows Programs, former teaching fellows have the opportunity to remain engaged in the Knowles community throughout their careers and be supported in ongoing leadership efforts. Senior fellow projects grow the capacity of the Knowles network by enhancing senior fellows' knowledge, skills, and experience. They allow senior fellows to uh, feed their expertise back into the network while providing the opportunity and support to leverage those skills, knowledge, and experiences to have an impact beyond Knowles. So I'll briefly describe three senior fellow projects as examples of the kinds of opportunities that senior fellows have. Introduced in 2014, the Knowles Coaching Network is designed to increase the use of peer coaching among fellows uh, and in broader educational context and enhance the climate of shared and reflective professional practice in the community. So many of our senior fellows uh, and some of their colleagues have been trained as peer coaches across the last five or six years. And these trained coaches are putting their training to work in their local school context. Uh, and also have opportunities to serve as coaches for the teaching fellowship. In December 2014, the Knowles Teacher Initiative published the inaugural issue of its journal, Kaleidoscope, Educators, Voices, and Perspectives. Through Kaleidoscope, Knowles shares stories from teachers about teaching, leading, and learning. Under the leadership of a senior fellow-led editorial board, the journal is published twice a year. Additionally, Knowles is providing leadership opportunities for senior fellows through the Knowles Academy. The Knowles Academy offers professional development experiences for all teachers. Academy courses are co-developed by Knowles staff and senior fellows, or are developed primarily by senior fellows with staff acting as mentors or coaches. And if you visit our website, you can learn more about our course offerings and also about the work we do with schools and districts uh, all over the country. So before I start to talk about benefits, I'll stop here to see if we have any questions. Rebecca? Before the webinar, we had someone email us a couple of questions, so I'm going to go through those now. Their first question was, how strong is the community of fellows and alumni or senior fellows? It's a very strong community. Now, it is uh, numbering. Um, over 500 at this point. So certainly not everyone um, knows everyone and we've been offering teaching fellowships beginning in 2002. So it's a, a long range. But uh, undoubtedly the most important feature of the teaching fellowship program is the community. That's what fellows tell us consistently. As you're going to hear we have generous benefits, we provide uh, very good uh, professional development to them. They have opportunities to get additional professional development materials, as you'll hear about. But overwhelmingly, the most important feature of the Teaching Fellows Program um, is the community. It's their cohort, and it's the other fellows that they, um, that they interact with over their time in the Teaching Fellowship. The Senior Fellows Program, as well, uh, is a really vital part of what we do. Uh, and it's got extremely strong connections um, with the Teaching Fellows Program. Tonight after the webinar, I'm gonna be meeting with five or six senior fellows who are continuing to work on project-based learning and talking about how it 
uh, can impact our wider uh, Knowles community. So it's a very strong community that continues to um, continues to grow and strengthen. What are the commitments asked of fellows during their time in the program? Um, we're going to hear about a little bit of that as we get into the um, into uh, the benefits of the program. But fellows are they meet regularly with their cohorts uh, three times a year in person when traveling is feasible. Uh, and so uh, three times a year, they would fly to a location and have a meeting with their cohort, again, when travel's uh, permitted. In addition, they meet roughly monthly with their cohort in an online space. So, uh, and then they might be collecting some data uh, in their classrooms and then sharing that data with other fellows during the year. So we certainly know that new teachers in particular are incredibly busy and uh, we don't assign a lot of, uh, uh, it's not like going to graduate school or something along those lines. It's really more about very targeted work that is, um, <clears throat> it's very targeted to the, the kinds of things that they're working on in the fellowship. Are there repercussions or condemnations for moving into a different position in your school during the five years of the fellowship? For example, to an administration, administrative position related to curriculum development or coaching? Uh, in order to be a teaching fellow, you have to be a classroom teacher. And so um, if you uh, are not a classroom teacher, for example, if you become a, an assistant principal or a full-time instructional coach, uh, then at that point you wouldn't, couldn't be a fellow anymore. So yeah, you are required to stay uh, at least half time as a classroom teacher while you are a fellow. And a couple of questions we've received from the question and answer chat box. How have the cohorts been impacted by the pandemic? Um, well, I think our fellows, I'm sure that everybody on the call um, is involved with schools one way or the other. And whether you're supporting new teachers or whether you're currently a teacher or whether you're studying to be a teacher. And so obviously this has been an incredibly challenging time within, um, within schools and within education and it continues to be. Uh, it's not clear yet when that's gonna change. So I think our fellows have been uh, greatly impacted on their own professional level. Um, and I, I think that for some of them, uh, the Knowles community has been an incredibly valuable uh, place for support and ideas. Um, within the within their professional communities you know so we haven't been meeting at, in person obviously since uh, March so our fellows meet online regularly they meet as a community we held uh, you'll hear about our annual summer conference we held uh, that virtually and remotely this year so we've uh, continued to meet continue to invest in one another as a community um, but it has been incredibly challenging I think fellows are um, are Zoom exhausted, as I'm sure probably many of you are. Um, and so it's been, a, been difficult to sort of um, uh, to um, weather this, you know. And so I think we're doing well, and I think we provide support to one another, but, you know, it's certainly it's been a very, very challenging time for us. And one more question. Uh, how much is teaching for equity valued in the community? Uh, a great deal. So uh, teaching uh, for equity, teaching for, for all students, um, being uh, very intentional about um, the uh, value um, that teachers can bring to promoting equity within their schools and their classroom is really central uh, to the work that we do. So we have a um, when we think about phase one, we think about it's really about teaching. When we think about phase two, it's really uh, about teacher leadership. Um, 
And then inquiry and equity are two strands that sort of hold the fellowship uh, together. So it's, a, it's very central to what we do, both teaching and leading for equity, and it's a significant part of, um, of what good teaching and good teacher leadership looks like, and that's reflected in our, in our program. I think those are all of our general questions for now. That's great. Those are good questions. We'll, uh, we'll see. I'm sure more will arise here as we get going. So I'll turn now to, uh, to benefits. So Noble's Teaching Fellows do receive uh, a comprehensive array of benefits which have been designed to meet the needs of early career teachers. These include financial support, mentoring and coaching, and membership in a national community of math and science teachers. Uh, Noble supports fellows financially by offering grants to cover expenses associated with purchasing classroom materials and engaging in professional development. To access funds for materials or professional development, our fellows go through a proposal process with our staff so that they can uh, learn to articulate the relationship between needs, goals, strategies, outcomes, budget. And this process is uh, similar in scope and content to other funding sources used by teachers. So often when our fellows leave the teaching fellowship or even when they're in it, they become quite good at writing grants and accessing that kind of thing in their uh, local communities as well. Uh, in addition to grants, fellows are also able to receive uh, summer stipends. We recognize that our fellows are highly accomplished and have often made financial sacrifices, both to become a teacher and to remain in the teaching profession. And so these stipends allow them to reduce their debts they might have incurred or reduce the financial burden that they uh, often bear, both of which are factors that can contribute to sustainability in the profession. So siphons can be used to support fellows uh, financially during those summer months and let them concentrate on reflecting on the past year, preparing for the coming year uh, and professional development rather than taking on a part-time job during the summer or something like that, as many teachers need to do. The exact amounts uh, available to fellows for grants and stipends are subject to board approval on an annual basis. Uh, during uh, this particular academic year, each fellow has $9,000 available to them to use for professional development, classroom materials, and summer stipends, and we'll soon be making a decision about what that amount is for the 2021-22 school year. We value the expertise and knowledge of skillful teachers, which is why we support our fellows with lots of opportunities for mentoring and coaching. In fact, we recruit staff with significant teaching experience uh, and our staff have over 100 years of teaching experience and we view ourselves um, first and foremost as teachers. And as experienced teachers, we play a mentoring role. We check in with fellows, we support them to plan and reflect on instruction. We talk them through challenging professional dilemmas. Uh, we support them through personal challenges. And our staff will observe fellows teach, either virtually or in person, and coach them into improvement in a way that the fellow really directs. In addition to staff, we support fellows with um, each cohort with uh, veteran teachers, most of them with over 20 years of experience, both as teachers and teacher leaders. And we call them team specialists, and they bring on the ground experience and credibility. They attend the meetings, they support fellows in their inquiry virtually and they provide counsel as true master teachers. Knowles Fellows are able to tap into a support network of more than 400 teachers who are committed to improving science and math education, uh, from in-person conversations that take place at meetings to virtual conversations that take place in our online community. That kind of support and that network is always uh, close by. So I'd like to walk you through uh, what a typical year looks like for a teaching fellow. And uh, I say typical in particular, um, it's not exactly what this year, uh, past year has looked like. Um, but we're hopeful about uh, the upcoming school year. So it will begin for the 2021 cohort uh, or the 2021 fellows with an orientation in July. 
that immediately precedes uh, summer conference. Uh, the primary goal of this meeting is to help new fellows learn about the culture and norms of the Knowles community that they're joining. Each new cohort spends uh, time working with staff and team specialists to learn about inquiry, learn how to be critical friends to each other uh, and to their colleagues. They're supported to examine how they think about their own mathematics or science disciplines, how they think about themselves as learners, and how their disciplinary knowledge may need to be adapted or deepened for the work of teaching. And they learn about Knowles, and they learn all about uh, the ways that Knowles uh, will be supporting them um, in the five years to come uh, at this orientation as uh, growing teachers and as potential leaders in the profession. For existing fellows and for the rest of the community, the Knowles Summer Conference is the official start to each fellowship year. And this three-day meeting takes place in July, uh, usually in Philadelphia. It is a distinctive event uh, that brings together many members of the Knowles community, typically about 250 participants, to interact with, uh, learn from uh, one another uh, within a variety of settings and structures. So all, uh, all of the cohorts of current teaching fellows attend the meeting along with senior fellows who are engaged in specific activities related to summer conference, as well as staff and other experts in math and science. The summer conference is divided up between opportunities for fellows to work within their cohorts and opportunities for them to engage with the wider community. So in the morning, teaching fellows will work with each other aligned um, within their year uh, to work on the specific phase of the fellowship that they're in. And then in the afternoon, meeting participants attend their choice of learning sessions that have been proposed, reviewed, designed, and led by fellows. These learning sessions might be structured as an interactive presentation, a workshop, or uh, a collaborative learning group. Fellows who lead these sessions are provided with a coach who is a Knowles Senior Fellow who's participated in our coaching uh, network and supports session leaders to establish learning goals and evaluate the effectiveness of their session. Fellows also choose a book to read throughout each summer and they organize a variety of uh, unconference style discussions about the book throughout the meeting. And last and probably um, one of the most important things that happens at summer conference certainly is fellows have opportunities to organize informal discussions over meals, and during meeting breaks, and honestly late into the night, that allow them to find common ground, organize working groups, and discuss topics that interest them. In addition to summer conference, we bring all members of the cohort together twice a year uh, to meet in person, and we're hopeful that we'll be able to do that again next fall. It is a significant investment, uh, but it is a crucial piece of our support for beginning teachers. Um, meeting in person uh, does some really important things for us. First, uh, our staff plan and implement really high quality professional development for fellows that introduce them to important new ideas in the fields of math and science and teacher, um, and teacher leadership. They support the fellows in how to consider how to use those ideas, uh, make sense of them in their local context, and they equip fellows to plan for implementing changes to their practice as teachers and leaders. Second, while our fellows engage in robust work online, the intense time they spend with one another at meetings and at meals um, serve as crucial components of our community building. We explicitly and purposely use meetings to build that community. We help fellows decide on and reinforce their cohort norms. We give fellows choices about how their cohorts use their time. We provide space for fellows to reflect on how the cohort is working together. And so these meetings strengthen the really close bonds between fellows, staff, and the team specialists who come. And finally, while we do strive to be careful stewards of Knowles resources, we also recognize that teachers deserve to be treated like professionals. And to that end, we make sure that fellows are treated well. We eat, <laughs> we eat well together. Uh, we make our meeting sites pleasant spaces to be and work together. 
and we recognize that teachers learn best when they have agency over their over their learning so our staff work closely with fellows as they plan meetings getting feedback and input about their needs we really hope that these meetings serve almost like a retreat for fellows uh, and so they are a valuable and important part of our investment in the fellowship the sense of community that we foster does require a consistent investment of fellows in one another and of our staff in fellows and so given that our fellows are spread across the country it does mean that a lot of our work uh, and in fact all of our work now occurs in a virtual space um, that is our, our our online community fellows engage with our online community in many ways uh, both asynchronously and synchronously supported through the use of google hangouts and zoom and they engage in inquiry with one another there, so they're generating and analyzing data. They bring other fellows into inquiry. They discuss artifacts, they discuss findings. When they learn things in school, they're supported in trying those, uh, I'm sorry, when they learn things in the fellowship, they're supported in trying these new things in their classrooms and schools, uh, and they experiment with new ways of teaching and leading, and then they share those experiences and the data they collect from their efforts in our online community. And our online community does serve as a site for discussions across cohorts and in building the network. So across cohorts, fellows engage in discussions about the pressing issues in school and in math and science education. They seek advice about dilemmas from one another. They share victories. They seek comfort when things are tough. And we have many smaller communities where fellows could even be 10 years apart in the fellowship. They have never met in person, but they do share a common interest where they can uh, geek out on the latest developments in project-based learning or standards-based grading or something like that. And then finally, the, the online community does serve as a resource for uh, learning about new opportunities for professional development or for new jobs in local schools. And so really it extends each fellow's network to one another in, uh, in a multiplying way. So Rebecca, are there any uh, any other questions that have come up that are about the benefits that are available? Yes, we have one question so far. Does Knowles bring in outside speakers for these conferences or do most of the speakers come from within the Knowles community? Um, it's a mix of both. So at summer conference, traditionally we do have an outside speaker or outside speakers who come that are connected in some way to the book that we read uh, as a community. Sometimes it's the author. Sometimes it's another guest speaker who has expertise in the topic that we've been discussing. And then um, in the cohort meetings, uh, those are, um, will often have um, outside folks. Sometimes they're hired as specialists. Sometimes they're just outside consultants who will come and, um, help our staff lead professional development, depending on the topic. So um, there certainly is room and we have outside folks who come in and are engaged in our community in that way. With the uncertainty of present times, could you elaborate more on the previously mentioned question regarding failure to fulfill the requirements of the fellowship or having to forfeit it like are there financial consequences if a fellow stops teaching, stops teaching in a high school or moves to an administration role, some uh, examples like that? Yeah, absolutely. So the extent of the consequence is that uh, you wouldn't be a fellow anymore. So uh, if you were to, for example, if you stop teaching, uh, we allow you to take up to a year leave of absence. Uh, and then if you return to teaching, then you're permitted to return to the fellowship. Uh, but there's no kind of clawback provision. There's nothing, uh, there's no commitment that you make if you, um, no, I will say this, most of our fellows remain teaching. Um, and so we have a very high retention rate within the profession and with, when if, within education. But we do have fellows who figure out that teaching isn't for them or uh, family obligations pull them away from the classroom. Um, they just aren't a fellow anymore, but there there's no kind of financial ramifications or any kind of consequent like that. No, you don't owe us anything. Um, you aren't obligated to us in any kind of way. Uh, we certainly 
in fact, uh, they remain part of our online community and they're certainly even uh, still participate in our online discussions, all of that kind of stuff. It's just that we they can't receive the benefits of the fellowship uh, while they're not a classroom teacher. Do fellows pay to attend conference meetings or are travel expenses covered? Everything is covered. So yeah, uh, being a fellow will not cost um, anyone um, anything. Everything, all expenses to all meetings are covered. Uh, so including, you know, the taxi that you might need to take from your apartment to the airport, um, all meals, uh, all flights, all lodging, um, everything is entirely covered and there are no expenses to participate as a fellow. Can professional development funds or the stipend be spent towards graduate school? They absolutely can. Uh, the stipend can be spent on whatever the fellow chooses. So um, up to half of the annual amount can be spent on the stipend. And that money is, uh, is absolutely up to the fellow to decide how to use it. They receive checks during the summer uh, and they can use it like income. Uh, in terms of the professional development component, they can certainly write grants to cover courses for their graduate school. Um, and so they, they do that by justifying why the course is useful to them. Uh, but it's not uncommon at all for fellows to use that um, to, uh, to take a graduate course during the summer or during the school year. And that's been especially true since so much professional development has been in-person professional development has been canceled. We've had a lot of fellows who are taking online graduate courses with institutions across the country, and they are using that to, uh, to be able to do that while they're, um, while they have the uh, time or availability to do it. Will conference time conflict with teaching schedules? The summer conference is held in July, and that has never uh, created any kinds of, uh, of issues. Uh, typically, July is sort of the one month when most teachers are not teaching. Uh, though certainly that could change uh, this year with uh, with the way the schedules are. The fall and spring cohort meetings are held on Fridays and Saturdays. So fellows uh, leave on, uh, again, this is if they're traveling, they would leave on Thursday night after they've finished teaching their classes, fly to the location. We hold these meetings at different parts around the country. And then on Friday and Saturday, these are very full, long days. Um, they participate in professional development. And then on Sunday, they return home. Uh, we work with the schools to cover any cost to the school. So we pay for substitute teachers or anything that the school might need in order to make that work. Um, many of our fellows, are schools are happy to do it uh, and provide that, uh, that release time for them uh, to do it. In fact, all schools are happy to. We've never had any problems with schools not allowing teachers to attend. Uh, but we will pay for substitutes and we, um, uh, if the schools need it uh, on that Friday. Would maternity leave require you to take a year off from the fellowship? Nope. Uh, if you are taking a year off from teaching for maternity leave, then you would take a year off from teaching. Um, and then you would just return to the fellowship the next year when return to the classroom. But for most of our fellows, if they take 12, year, 12 weeks or 15 weeks off or something like that, they, um, they remain a fellow, they remain active. If they're, not, if they're on leave from their school, then they are technically on leave from, from the fellowship as well. But as soon as they return to the classroom, they're able to return to the fellowship as well. Is there any conflict with being a fellow or a recipient of a different fellowship or scholarship in addition to Knowles? No. And in fact, we have many of our fellows are, have received other kinds of uh, awards or fellowships. So we have fellows who are also um, Math for America, early career teachers or teacher leaders, Noyce scholars, um, Holly Hawk fellows, uh, Trellis, uh, I don't know if they're called Trellis fellows, Trellis scholars out in the Bay Area. So um, there's not uh, an issue and um, we don't see those as competition in any way and feel like um, 
the more support new teachers can get, the better. So it is not uncommon. And the only thing that has occasionally come up is that there might be, um, you know, if they both have meetings on the same days, but we've never, we've never not been able to work it out. And we've always been able to make sure that, uh, that they can meet their obligations that they, that they have. So no restrictions or anything uh, along those lines. And one last question. Of course. Is there any disadvantage or advantage to applying before your first year of teaching or during your first year of teaching? So while you're still in school versus being a first year teacher? There's no advantage or disadvantage. We keep track of that and people who are uh, applying while they're student teaching and applying with their first year both uh, receive the fellowship at about equal rates. But I would encourage you to do it um, the year that you are student teaching, because if you uh, aren't awarded one, you can apply a second year. And so it's not uncommon for people to apply two years uh, to the fellowship. And we have every year people who uh, didn't receive it the first year they applied who receive it the second year. Um, and so you get kind of two swings. And so we'd encourage you to apply while you're a, while you're a student teacher um, and um, before your first year. And then if you're able to still apply during your first year. So certainly we encourage you to apply twice and rather than to wait, um, to wait on that. Those are all of our benefits related questions. That's great. So let me talk a little bit about eligibility. So first, uh, the fellowship does seek to support individuals who intend to make teaching their primary career. So the fellowship is not intended uh, for someone who knows that they're going to spend just a few years teaching before turning to another profession. Second, in order to be eligible for the fellowship, applicants must have a recent knowledge of the content they intend to teach. So generally for us, that means that applicants have earned a content-related degree between 2011 and September 1st, 2021, so in the last 10 years. When an applicant registers and applies, they're asked to choose which content area they wish to be evaluated in throughout their process. And so those content areas are physics, chemistry, biology, or math. So depending on which content area they choose, we're seeking people who have roughly the equivalent of an undergraduate major in that content area. It doesn't necessarily mean that you intend to teach um, that area. So um, if you intend to teach math, for example, um, you may have a degree in math, but some of our fellows have degrees in engineering or other related fields. But it does mean that an applicant should have significant depth, breadth, and interconnectedness of knowledge from the coursework that they've taken. Additionally, applicants must have earned a secondary certification somewhere between January 1st, 2016 and September 1st, 2021, so within the last five years, with the goal of teaching full-time in a high school science or mathematics classroom no later than the fall of 2021. So even if an applicant is teaching in a school that does not require state certification, as is the case in some private or charter schools, we do require that applicants have that certification in order to be eligible. As every state has different rules about licensure or certification, we're happy to review your specific situation if you have any questions. And I'll say that again at the end, that um, if you have any worries about whether your certification or degree or transcripts um, meet the requirements, we encourage you to, to write us at apply at knowlesteachers.org, and we'll give you that again. Um, and we're happy to answer a question we get back to you. Uh, we want to make sure that you don't waste any time on this if you're not, if you're not eligible. And then finally, the fellowship is intended to support teachers who are first or second year teachers during the first year of the fellowship. So for the purpose of eligibility, we consider an applicant's first year of teaching to be the first year in which they teach full-time for the full academic year 
as the teacher of record. So for the 2021 cohort, which is the application that's open, that means that you're eligible if you are a first or second year teacher in the fall of 2021. Typically that means if you are a first year teacher now, today, or you are in a program that's preparing you to graduate this spring or in the summer, then you are eligible. Now, there again, there may be lots of different permutations. Uh, and if those uh, are there, we encourage you to send your inquiry to apply at knowlesteachers.org and we are happy to confirm your eligibility if you have any questions uh, at all. So before I turn to the application, uh, any questions that popped up there about eligibility, Rebecca? Yes, are the five years of the fellowship, are you required to stay at one school or can you transfer during that time? Nope, you're, you we do not have any school-based requirements as long as it's a school in the United States and as long as you're teaching uh, high school students. So, but uh, you can switch, it can be public, private, charter, and it's not unusual for our fellows to move from one school to the other in during the five years. Uh, it doesn't have to be a high need school um, like there might be in things like a noise scholarship or anything along those lines. Are alternatively or emergency certified teachers discouraged from applying? Will holding one of those certifications count against an applicant? It will not count against an applicant. Nope. As long as you have a state certification, um, then you meet our eligibility requirement it's not counted against you. Um, certainly we do evaluate, you know, your academic record and we look at um, coursework and the things you might've learned in a traditional teacher education program certainly may, may help you, but we have many fellows who have gone through alternative certification programs before becoming fellows. Um, pretty much any, any big alternative CERT program that you could think of, we've had fellows who have had that pathway on the way in. So we don't discourage it, we don't hold it against, um, we don't hold it against applicants in any way. If someone is on leave for a year, would they return to the same cohort? It's, it, uh, it really depends on the situation and the circumstance. Uh, we've had both situations. Sometimes when people are, on leave, they are able to um, return, uh, keep up kind of with the fellowship and return to their cohort. If they do that, they lose a year of fellowship benefits because obviously when their cohort graduates, they will as well. And then we've had fellows who choose to take a leave and then return with the year behind them so that they still have the five years of benefits. It's all you know, it's something we work out with fellows individually, and it's based on their particular needs and circumstances, reason for leave, those kinds of things. Would teaching middle school or teaching abroad be a forfeiture of the fellowship, or could that serve as a leave year? Um, we actually give you, um, if you're doing that, you, you have a year to switch to high school. So if, for example, you were employed as a middle school teacher during your first year of the fellowship, you could hang on to the fellowship as long as you knew that you would have to return to um, high school teaching by your second year of the fellowship. So you kind of have a year grace period to kind of get aligned with the teaching fellowship. Um, and at that point, then if you haven't, then you would need to go on leave and you could take a year leave of absence, um, but eventually to be able to complete the fellowship and to, to go on, you would need to be teaching high school uh, in the U.S. We're really looking for people that that's their intention. This is really a program for high school mathematics and science teachers in the United States. We understand there are sometimes circumstances uh, where that might not be possible, and that's why we do try to accommodate that, but it is a, um, it is a program for high school mathematics and science teachers in the United States. Would you share the average rate of acceptance? Sure, it varies uh, pretty widely by by that, but I, you could say 15 to 20 percent would be a fairly um, decent estimate uh, based on the past five years. Are science teaching degrees one of the qualifying degrees? 
Um, I think that's probably one that's best handled um, via email because I'm not quite sure. Uh, and the truth is that science teaching degrees look different from different institutions. Uh, and so I think ideally that would be one where um, if you wrote apply at knowlesteachers.org, you could um, to get could get information. It depends also if you're talking about an undergraduate or a graduate degree. So I think that's one that I would rather not try to answer that blanketly because the answer is sometimes yes, sometimes no. We would just need to see the transcript and, and understand more about the program. This question might be kind of specific, so I would recommend them in advance to also email apply at knowlesteachers.org, but um, it sounds like it might be something that's happening for other people, so I'm going to yes, sure. anyway. If uh, this person sounds like they're currently full-time teaching with a substitute certificate, they are planning to be certified by the end of spring, so they're wondering if they should apply now or wait until they are certified, and with the pandemic, they're not sure how long the process will take. Yeah, as long as you're certified by September of 2021, meaning you're on track for that certification, then you should apply this year. Yeah, so uh, it isn't, you don't have to hold a certification when you apply. You just have to be on track to be certified by September of 2021. So there are lots of circumstances like that where, um, where that's what's happening. So I, I think as long as it's, as long as you'll be certified by the end of September of 2021, um, as long as you think you're going to be, you should apply. If someone has submitted a referral for you, does that increase your chances of being accepted? Like uh, someone filled out a referral form on our website, which thank you to anyone who has already done that. It does not change your, um, it does not change your um, likelihood of being accepted. We do, as part of our application process, we ask for letters of reference. Um, and so I'll talk some about that. Those are valued um, as part of our, um, as part of our application process. The referrals are greatly valued, but they are not something that we pull in to the application and is not part of our review. It's really to make sure that we can uh, reach as wide a range of people as possible. And so we're really appreciative when people send those referrals, but it's not part of that. It is very likely perhaps that that person who did that would also write you uh, one of our letters of recommendation that would be part of our application. And one more as a confirmation, uh, mid are middle school teachers eligible for the fellowship? They're not eligible for the fellowship. No, this is only for high school mathematics and science teachers. Um, as I as I mentioned, if however um, you uh, like, for example, your first year you um, can't find a position that's in high school, you can only find a middle school position. We would allow you to do that for a year, but by your second year, in order to stay an active fellow, you would have to move to high school. Likewise, we've had fellows who, after two years, they're moving across the country because their partner has taken a position. And the only thing they can find is a middle school. Again, we give them a one-year grace period to kind of um, get that high school position. But it is not for middle school teachers. And you have to be as certified to be able to teach high school as well. That's part of, the, part of what we're looking for with that certification. Those are all our questions for now. Great. All right, so uh, to be considered, for the uh, 2021 Knowles Teaching Fellowship, applicants must uh, submit an online application, participate in a phone interview, uh, and participate in our interview weekend. Uh, as part of the application process, applicants are required to write three essays and obtain three letters of recommendation describing how they meet each of the three criteria. Each essay should respond to the prompt and provide evidence of the applicant's potential to develop in each criterion. The essay should demonstrate their ability to be reflective and should be grounded in their personal experiences. This allows us to get to know the applicant as an individual and as a teacher. Um, we encourage applicants to carefully choose three people that have particular insight into their potential to develop in one of each of our three criteria. So applicants should carefully explain the criteria on which they're asking references to write, share this presentation with them, for example, or 
um, even the information will be in the in what we send to references. So we do recommend that applicants make sure their references understand that we're not looking for three general letters of recommendation. As you can see, the application deadline this year is January 18th, 2021. Following a review of the written app applications, uh, semifinalists will be identified and applicants who are uh, selected as semifinalists will receive an email in February to schedule uh, a phone interview and those will begin in February of 2021. Those typically last an hour and they're designed to help us learn more about applicants with respect to our three criteria. Finally, if an applicant is selected as a finalist, uh, we invite them to participate in interview weekend. Um, that has traditionally been an in-person interview held in Philadelphia, uh, but this year it will all be handled uh, in a remote way. We're asking um, people who apply to still hold that weekend of April 30th and May 1st for those interviews. Um, we'll be providing more information about that online process uh, shortly. Uh, if an applicant um, is selected as a finalist and then determines later that they are not available on that day, then their application would be declined at that point. Upon submitting an application, we do ask you to confirm your availability uh, for three events should you uh, advance in the application process. If you know that you're not able uh, to attend any of those events, then you shouldn't complete the application. And the events are interview weekend orientation and summer conference. And as we discussed, uh, interview weekend will be uh, May 1st, 2021. The second event is orientation, and the third event is summer conference, and you can see the dates there as well. Uh, again, those dates um, are something you'll be asked about frequently, and so you should, if you're planning on being a fellow, make sure you're available during that time and that you would hold those um, uh, as the process uh, goes forward. Each year, we evaluate fellowship applicants with regard to three selection criteria. Successful fellowship applicants possess the potential to develop the content knowledge needed for teaching, exemplary teaching practices, and the qualities of a teacher leader. The first of our criteria is the potential to develop the content knowledge needed for teaching. Uh, exemplary teachers are able to connect their knowledge of the discipline with the learning needs of their students. Content knowledge for teaching is both broad and deep, and it is organized specifically for the work of teaching. It includes being able to transform expert knowledge for novices, anticipating student difficulties, build on prior knowledge. Um, we do expect fellows to have at least a bachelor's degree or the equivalent of a bachelor's degree in a field connected to the subject um, that they are applying in either physics, chemistry, mathematics, or biology. As I mentioned before, um, uh, when you select that topic of physics, chemistry, biology, or math, then uh, throughout the entire process, beginning with the written review up through interview weekend, uh, you are evaluated, your content knowledge is evaluated in that content area at every step uh, along the way. So we do look, uh, when we're evaluating content knowledge, we look at the essay, we look at uh, unofficial transcripts that you submit as part of your application, a resume or CV, and then uh, a letter of recommendation that is specific to content knowledge. And this is often, uh, for example, a professor in your college um, who can speak to your content knowledge. Perhaps it's somebody you did research with. Maybe it's uh, your cooperating teacher from student teaching who knows how strong your content knowledge was but you're really trying to get somebody who can speak to your content knowledge. The second criterion focuses on an applicant's potential to develop exemplary teaching practices. Uh, outstanding teachers have mastery of a number of professional skills, such as um, the ability to communicate clearly, plan, being flexible. And so we know that you won't have a wide range of teaching experiences given the spot you are in your career. 
So we are trying to determine how much you um, are able to master or will be able to master some of the most important skills demanded of teachers. We look for indicators like an applicant's reason for choosing high school science or mathematics teaching as a profession uh, and any efforts they've made to understand the work of high school teachers. We also consider experiences the applicant has had working with adolescents or with teaching and what they've learned from those experiences. A lack of experience with either adolescents or teaching does not necessarily make an applicant less competitive. And conversely, experience teaching or participating in a teacher preparation program does not necessarily make an applicant a stronger candidate. Rather, we weigh the quality of the insights the applicant has gained against whatever experiences they've had. So when evaluating exemplary teaching practices, we look at their essay, we look at the resume and CV, and then again, we look at a, a letter of recommendation that's specifically about someone's potential to become uh, an outstanding teacher. These again, are typically people who have seen you teach, whether it's a, in your student teaching, a colleague, um, maybe if you worked at a, at a camp or something like that where you were working and teaching regularly, that's typically who writes those letters. And then finally, the third selection criterion is the potential to develop the qualities of a teacher leader. So we're committed to the belief that teachers can and should be change agents in education. And so we're seeking people who have developed the capacity for collaborative leadership in their previous experiences and who demonstrate the likelihood of continuing to develop as leaders in and from the classroom. So in order to evaluate uh, the potential of someone to be a teacher leader, we look at their essay, uh, the, resum the resume, and uh, CV, and a letter of recommendation for somebody who can speak to leadership potential. And this, again, um, this is probably the most diverse set of letters that we get. So this could be somebody who knows you from a setting um, outside of education entirely, maybe a, a former boss or colleague in a job or someone else who can, maybe a coach. Uh, or it could be a colleague from a school who, even as your first year teacher, has um, recognized your likelihood of becoming a teacher leader. But we're really looking for essays that are specific to, to teacher leadership. So with that, I will take any other questions that have come up. What if someone is certified in more than one math or science field? Can they only apply for one field? Yes, uh, they'll choose in the application um, one content area, the one that uh, we would recommend, the one that you have the most uh, coursework preparation for, uh, the one that you feel the most confident in, um, and that will either be physics, chemistry, biology, or mathematics, and, um, and that's the field that you'll be assessed in throughout the, throughout the application process. That's all. Oh, sorry. There's one more. <laughs> sure. um, are there caps on yearly recipients given a certain subject area? So is there a breakdown of like 25% biology, 25% chemistry, or is it our recipients selected based solely on the three criteria? Yep. They're based, it's based on the three criteria. Um, uh, it historically roughly um, has been about uh, one third mathematics one-third biology, one-sixth physics, and one-sixth chemistry. Uh, but that was not true in last year's cohort. Um, so, uh, but that is roughly um, how it goes. And that, that's close to, to what it is nationally, although there's probably more biology and mathematics teachers than physics and chemistry even in that proportion. But we're looking for top candidates, and we don't have caps room limits uh, by, by uh, content area. Okay, so if you would like more information, uh, please, uh, it's probably how you found us already for this, but visit knowlesteachers.org backslash Knowles Fellowship. Um, you can follow us on social media. We post uh, tips and things along the way about the application uh, in those places. But I think I would most wanna say is, uh, please do not hesitate to use apply at knowlesteachers.org to ask us questions. We want you to have the information you need to be able to apply, so please do that. And don't hesitate, it's a, we're a, 
Uh, we're a family foundation, a group of 20 of us who work here. And um, if you send in a question, it's going to be Rebecca or Megan or me who answers it. And so uh, please don't hesitate to, to reach out to us. We're happy to help and happy to make sure you get the information you need to do it. If you are a current student teacher or first year teacher, then I would recommend tonight that you go to the website and you register. Um, and you can get started on the application, learn about the essay prompts without, um, without completing it tonight in any way. So, but go ahead, get registered. It gets you into the system. Uh, and that way then we know um, that you're interested in what we're doing and we'll, and we'll be sure to follow up with you um, as the deadline approaches. Thanks so much for, for coming in, uh, out tonight to, uh, to hear from us. We hope that you uh, are interested or that you know somebody who is and get them some information. And thank you for the work that you're doing in schools. And we're, we're hopeful that, uh, that we can support you down the line. Thanks so much. Have a good night.